Frontier Fighters. Frontier Fighters, inspiring episodes in the dramatic careers of those intrepid sons of courage whose destiny it was to safeguard for posterity the glory of the Old West. In 1827, the American Congress and the British Parliament ratified the extension of the Agreement of 1818, which gave joint occupancy to a great area of land in which lay the territory of Oregon. Oregon was almost a lost country until immigrants followed the missionaries and shrewd Yankee traders began to follow the immigrants. The balance of power suddenly swung over to the Americans because of their numbers. And with the advent of a political year, Oregon, under American rule as a free state, became a national issue. The original agreement between the United States and Great Britain did not specifically speak of 5440 as being the northern boundary of Oregon. But the settlers so interpreted the agreement because that parallel meant all of Oregon would be under United States rule. In July 1843, an Oregon convention was held at Cincinnati. Convention, we've done a great deal of wild shouting, not a little applauding. We've given undue exercise to our military band. <laughs> but, gentlemen, to what definite conclusions have we come? We have not as yet declared for any kind of a parallel in this growing dispute between the United States and Great Britain. I'm for holding off. You'll have to relax. No, 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 no. no, you speak me mouth about it. I'm for coming right out and saying the parallel should be the 49. That's 5440. And that gives the whole of Oregon to the United States. Ain't fair for Great Britain. And what ain't fair ain't right. Our aim should be justice for all. A show of hands from the delegates who hold for 5440 and United States rule. Looks like there's a majority. Five, ten, twenty, sixty, seven, ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine out of a hundred. There's one more, and it's unanimous. <laughs> Therefore, agreed by the delegates here convened that the northern boundary of Oregon is fifty-four forty. <laughs> loomed upon the horizon as a purely territorial affair, suddenly became an item of national interest which aroused the country. The chairman of the Democratic Party remarked to its candidate, Mr. Polk, I think I have a slogan for the Democratic Party that will put its candidate into the White House. You have? <laughs> and will it keep him there? Keep him there if he isn't afraid of trouble with Great Britain. Oregon and that boundary, eh? Yes, Mr. Polk. But not trouble that can be settled by talking all around the issue. The citizens of the United States do not wish to be under British rule. Mm, I suppose decisive measures of some kind will have to be taken soon. The entire country is being aroused. 
It is no longer a matter of hundreds of thousands of square miles of land. It is an affair of national pride, of dominion. And you think I should champion this cause for political purposes? If so, I should not care to have made of a national issue a political one. After all, if our sovereign rights are in danger, the politics of the presidency are of minor importance. Mr. Polk, when I came into our campaign headquarters, I looked upon you as the ultimate leader of our party. Now I look upon you as a gentleman who is a defender of American rights and ideals. I hope you'll use the slogan even more now than ever before. <laughs> oh, yes. That famous slogan that is about to elect me. Uh, what is it? Uh... 5440, or fight. As the campaign Pope for President progressed, the national and the political situation became so intertwined that the nation witnessed the spectacle of a man who was sure to ride into office on the slogan, 5440 or fight. The politician sniffed the air and smelled 5440 or fight as a sure-fire issue. Gone was the careful policy of President Tyler and Daniel Webster. The country was in flames, and Polk, his eyes on the presidency, fed those flames with empty patriotic phrases. The whole of Oregon or none. But when the first Congress convened in the winter of 1845 and 6 and resolutions were introduced to give notice of the termination of joint occupancy, the senior Southern Senator Calhoun sprang to his feet and shouted, I, for one, do not wish to confuse issues, and I'll say there is only one measure to be considered, and that is the annexation of Texas. <laughs> Mr. President, the senators from the South, led by their own trickster, Mr. Calhoun, have betrayed us. That is a lie, sir, and I challenge you, boy. I challenge you, boy. Senators from the Middle West at first opposed the annexation of Texas, a slavery state, until we learned that President Polk and the Southern senators, all of us, would work heartily together for the addition of Oregon to the Union to balance the power of free states and slave states. And now, the senator from South Carolina says, there is only one issue, the annexation of Texas. I say again, gentlemen, that we have been betrayed by Senator Calhoun of Judas. <laughs> Almost upon the heels of the fiery debates in the Senate came the pageant of the Mexican War. It was thought all questions raised by the frontier settlements in the Northwest would be subdued, while the conflict between the United States and Mexico raged on. However, in Oregon, the feeling became more tense. Men armed, men drilled, men burned to protect their rights. The whole of Oregon or none was the cry, along with 5440 or fight. But few men knew exactly where 5440 was. 5440 or fight. If Washington won't protect our sovereign rights, we will. If we can't be with the United States, we'll be independent of the United States. All Polk does is write notes. We want action. We want to fight for our rights. Hey, hey, you men, they've mounted cannon in Vancouver, taking it from the warship. Mounted cannon? Well, we can mount cannon, too. You bet we can mount cannon. Stop, stop all of you. There'll be no mob rule here. It's the captain. Now, quiet. All of you. They've mounted cannon in Vancouver, sir. Let them. But we'll mount no cannon. We recognize this soil upon which we stand as American soil, and we'll protect it with our lives. But God forbid, gentlemen, that we should by one act, word, or deed start a war. <laughs> With every hour, the situation grew more tense. President Polk, involved in a war with Mexico, turned the entire matter over to James Buchanan, his new Secretary of State. Buchanan immediately opened negotiations with Lord Aberdeen, representing the government of Queen Victoria. The hotheads on both sides of the water clamored for war, but the British cabinet was eager for either compromise or arbitration. The government of Her Majesty had its hands full with military operations in distant Afghanistan and China. A stubborn fight was in progress with the Sikhs in India. There was friction with the Dutch in South Africa and the famine in Ireland. 
Folk, hammered on all sides. Advise Buchanan to sound out the leaders in the Senate. Well, well, Buchanan, Mr. President, we're caught between two fires. Many members are opposed to war with Great Britain. Others clamor for war. The militarists in England are crying for the kingdom to arm. In this extreme moment, what do you advise? I shall continue to sue for an amicable settlement of this tragically unfortunate issue. You, sir, to save the face of your administration, had better go before Congress and ask for an adequate military force to guard and protect such of our citizens as might think it proper to emigrate to Oregon. Weeks passed. Oregon desperate men, afraid they would become lost in a shuffle of political cards, afraid that the issue had died, decided to revive it and force the federal government to recognize Oregon, even if they themselves started a war. Upon the heels of these proposed desperate actions, the frigate Virginia anchored in Puget Sound. Messengers on horseback raced to meet the boat. I'll bet there's red hot news from Washington, D.C. I ain't uh, aiming to speculate, but I got a feeling it's war. I'm wondering if it was war, the United States wouldn't send out just one frigate. Oh, there, boys. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Guess we'll just about meet the boats as they touch the shore. Yeah. Ahoy there! You from the port? Yes. Got dispatches? Uh, two bags full. You know what's in them? Do we get Oregon? Uh, under orders not to tell what I know. You'll find out soon enough when the commander at the port opens this bag of dispatches. It's news that'll change the whole history of the United States. <laughs> Gentlemen, attention! Gentlemen, I have the honor to announce that Great Britain accepts the 49th parallel. Hey! It's 54 40, all right, and Oregon is ours without having so much as fired one shot. <laughs> Thanks to the cool heads of Secretary of State Buchanan for the United States, Lord Aberdeen for Great Britain, a war was averted. And while certain compromises were effected and concessions made to the Hudson's Bay Company, the limits of Oregon were at last definitely set. On Sunday morning, March 13th, 1846, Oregon was a full-fledged territory of the United States. Today, in the vast territory of old Oregon, citizens of the United States live in the closest possible harmony with her neighbors in British Columbia who salute the Union Jack. And both sides, during those stirring days of 45 and 46, can indeed be called trailblazers and frontier fighters.